And speaking of innovation, there is talk of a major invention in the world of semiconductors. Let me underline the word major. Some are calling it the holy grail of chips, a superconductor. So what exactly is the buzz all about? Time for a quick science lesson. In the past, we've told you what a semiconductor is. It's a material through which you can pass electricity. You can regulate the flow, meaning electricity will pass in some conditions, but it won't otherwise. Now, this property makes them crucial to make electronics. Cars, mobiles, headphones, weapons, all of them have semiconductors inside, what we call chips. But this flow of electricity is not absolute. There is some resistance. And that's where superconductors are different. They allow electricity to pass with zero resistance. Let's try an example. Imagine you're driving on a straight highway. Your car is the electricity. The highway is the conductor. Now imagine there are traffic signals in between. Naturally, you would have to stop. So you would be slower and you would lose fuel and time. That's what a semiconductor is like. With superconductors, there are no traffic signals. It's pedal to the metal. You save time and fuel. Scientists in South Korea claim to have created such a substance, a superconductor. They're calling it LK99. You make it by introducing copper atoms to a mineral called lead apatite. Two studies have been published so far. The initial one has three authors. The second one has six. Other labs in the US and China are already testing it out. They're seeing if the claim checks out. We'll get to that in a bit. But first, what are the real world applications of a superconductor? How can we use them? Again, let's use two examples. We've all seen how power grids work. They transfer electricity using semiconductors, which means resistance. And this resistance results in some power being wasted. Distribution loss. No such problem with superconductors. You won't lose power while transferring it. Imagine how much electricity we would save. Another example is gadgets. Computing time is proportional to the speed of electricity. The faster you can conduct, the faster the results. Again, superconductors can help. They could make your computers and phones much faster. So why haven't we made them before? Well, superconductors do exist. We use them in MRI machines and medical imaging. But all of them have one problem. They need extremely low or extremely high temperatures to work. One example is caprate. It's a superconductor, but it can only work at minus 135 degrees Celsius. Your colleague at office cannot handle 38 degrees. Good luck with minus 135. My point is it's not possible. You need superconductors that work at room temperature, which is why LK99 is so important. The Korean scientists say it does work at room temperature. Do others agree? Three labs in China have managed to create LK99 and they're reporting different results, all three of them. One of them showed LK99 levitating over a magnet. Only superconductors do that, they levitate. Other materials spin like a compass. I guess that's a plus point. The second lab did not observe zero resistance. The third lab did, but at minus 130, 163 degrees Celsius. So that's a no-go. The fact is we need to study this material more. Even if it is a superconductor, that's just half the job done. You need to figure out a lot more, like how much electricity can it conduct? How do you mass produce it? How do you embed these things in devices? So we have a long way to go. It's a long shot still. But there is good news and bad news here. The bad news is that such superconductor claims are not new. Most of them end up disappointing. It's so common that there's a word for it. They, they call it USO, Unidentified Superconductor Object. The good news is there is nothing unnatural about it. The laws of physics support the idea of a superconductor. They can be made. It's all about stumbling on the right material. Even if LK99 is not that holy grail, it is still valuable. Each failed invention gives a lot of information, information that could help us build a working superconductor. And now let's talk about the weather in South Korea. The country is going through a heat wave. Temperatures have hit 38 degrees Celsius in some parts, which is not very much if you're watching us from India. But in South Korea, it has led to this. There are a lot of children in Korea for an event. 
the World Scout Jamboree, that's the event. Now, some of you may know about Scouts and Guides. It's an institution that helps young people learn outdoor survival skills. And about 40,000 Scouts from around the world have gathered in South Korea, but the heat has played spoil sport. Hundreds of these Scouts and Guides in their teens have suffered from heat-related ailments. And the government of South Korea is ramping up efforts to address the issue. They're pulling out all the stops, both to save face and to save the event. Here's a report. South Korea is hosting an event right now, the World Scout Jamboree. It's a gathering of scouts and guides from around the world, the first one since the pandemic. And South Korea is hosting the event with great fanfare. The country's president, Yoon suk yeol and First Lady Kim Kyun-hee were at the opening ceremony. Please give them a big round of applause again. Yoon even gave a speech during the event. The event was quite high profile. Celebrity adventurer Bear Grylls was also present. What a sight! And they all kicked off the 12-day camp. South Korea's Minister of Gender Equality and Family is a co-head of the organizing committee. You can tell that Seoul wanted the event to be a grand success. But it seems they didn't expect one thing to dampen spirits, the heat. South Korea has been going through an intense heat wave. Parts of the country are sweltering under 38 degrees Celsius heat. Seoul has issued its highest heat warning. But it seems the country didn't take enough precautions for the World Scout Jamboree. About 600 of the participants, mostly children between the ages of 14 and 18, have suffered heat exhaustion. Many have even had to go to the hospital near the camp. Others have been forced to rest, sometimes with IV drips to ensure they're safe. Hundreds of rescue personnel have been deployed at the event. And South Korea's government is keeping a close eye on the situation. Regarding medical matters, the total number of outpatient visits yesterday was 1,486. Among them, 383 people were bitten by insects, accounting for 26.1%. 250 people had skin rashes and 138 people experienced heat-related symptoms, among others. South Korea wants the event to go off smoothly. So much so that the president has personally been involved in fixing the situation. The recent decree from the president of Korea gives Minister Kim increased ability and resources to provide water, shade, umbrellas, cooling buses, doctors and nurses to the site immediately. Now our viewers from India and other tropical countries may not understand what all the fuss is about. After all, 38 degrees Celsius may seem like a normal day. But that's not the case in most other parts of the world. What we consider hot is relative to what we're used to. And so many people around the world are not prepared to face this sort of heat. South Korea is definitely one example of a country not prepared for temperatures close to 40 degrees Celsius. 16 people have already died there due to the ongoing heat wave. This is according to government data. Construction workers in the capital Seoul are protesting. They're demanding protections against the heat. South Korea's heat wave is reaching a peak. Even though temperatures are exceeding 35 degrees, there is no rest for construction workers. It is becoming hard to even use the restrooms. We are holding this news conference calling for legislation since we are having problems on the lack of basic facilities. Thermal cameras have been depicting the heat in Seoul. The city's monuments are a bright red. They're burning up. And this is definitely taking a toll on people. When I first started farming, there were no sudden and unexpected downpours. Global warming didn't progress that much at that time, so it was not that hot either. However, it's getting warmer and sudden rainstorms are happening a lot more. It's out of our individual abilities. I was worried about heavy rains, but after the rains, the weather is extremely hot now. I'm exhausted. I've lost hope in farming. 
farmers are among the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And some, like those farmers, are losing hope. We need to do our part to mitigate climate change. If not, then we may have a future where the heat stops children from even venturing into the great outdoors. And now let's turn our attention to the West African nation of Niger. The coup leaders are still in power, for now at least. They've, issued, they've been issued an ultimatum by a bloc of West African countries. These countries have said that Niger's military junta must restore the presidency of the ousted leader. Mohamed Bazoum. Either that or risk a military intervention. These countries will intervene militarily. That's what they've said. The deadline they've said, set is of Sunday. But it seems that the junta has no intention of stepping down. They're already issuing decrees and scrapping decade-old agreements. The target of their ire seems to be France. France once colonized Niger. There's been an outpouring of anger against France recently. Supporters of the coup have blamed France for the poor conditions in their country. And it's likely that the junta will continue to paint Paris as the villain, which throws up the question, what happens to Fran France's interests in this country, in Niger, especially its supply of uranium to power its nuclear reactors? You see, France relies on nuclear power for 70% of its electricity production. And Niger is one of its biggest suppliers of this nuclear fuel. So will the coup in Niger lead to blackouts in France? Here's a report. Last week, a coup took place in the West African nation of Niger. And it does have its supporters. Hundreds of them have been taking to the streets of the capital, Niamey. Ask them why they support the coup, and you'll find a common theme in their answers. The world must understand that Africa's misfortune is France, the authorities, because the French are citizens like us, so we can't hate them. But we hate their authorities, because they've done too much harm to our country, and really, enough is enough. We have uranium, we have diamonds, we have gold, we have oil, and we live like slaves. Why should we? Until when? We can't accept it. The French base in Niger must leave. We don't need the French to keep us safe. There have been attacks on the French embassy in Niger's capital. The French troops stationed in Niger are being asked to go home. And supporters of the coup have been vocally opposing France. The military junta has also been ramping up the anti-French rhetoric. In view of France's casual attitude and reaction to the internal situation prevailing in our country, the National Council for Safeguarding the Homeland has decided to denounce France's security and defense cooperation agreements. Five military deals have been revoked. These deals were signed decades ago, between 1977 and 2020. So to revoke them clearly sends a message that Niger's new junta considers France the enemy. And that could be a good strategy to get public support. France and Niger share a troubled history. Niger was a French colony till 1960. So were a lot of other West African nations. Mauritania, Senegal, Mali, Guinea, Ivory Coast, Burkina Faso, Benin. All these nations were part of what was once called French West Africa. And no matter what tone-deaf justifications the former colonizers give, colonization always leads to the exploitation of the colonies. There's a reason Niger was one of the poorest nations in the world even before the coup. This is a country rich in natural resources. Uranium, gold and oil, like one of the demonstrators mentioned earlier. But it was still considered one of the poorest nations in the world because it has been in a situation that most former colonies face, an unequal power dynamic with its former colonizer. Some critics call it neo-colonization. Raw materials like uranium from Niger go to a former colonizer like France. It is used to fuel French nuclear power plants. The French energy sector benefits, sells its electricity abroad, generates billions, and then gives some of the money back to Niger as aid. This isn't a hypothetical scenario. This actually happens. France generates around $3.3 billion a year selling electricity. 
Meanwhile, Niger, which supplies about 18% of France's and 5% of the world's uranium, remains poor. You can imagine that it would frustrate the people there. Niger's uranium is just one example. There are other resources and raw materials in all the former colonies that continue to get exploited. And it could explain the anti-French sentiment in the other coup-hit nations in the region, like Mali and Burkina Faso. It's an existing wound, a festering injustice, and military juntas can easily tap into this negative sentiment to become popular among the people. But then what? If Niger stops sending uranium to France and Europe, the colonizers will still survive. Economic and trade relations between Niger and France are extremely tenuous. Of course, people always think of uranium when they talk about Niger. But over the last 10 years, it appears that Niger is France's fifth largest supplier of uranium. So it is no longer the strategic partner for uranium that it may have been in the 60s, 70s and the 80s. EU utilities have sufficient inventories of natural uranium to mitigate any short-term supply risks and for the medium and long-term there, uh, there, there are enough deposits on the world market to cover the EU needs. That is something that we have uh, ascertained. Finding new partners takes time. Time that the fragile West African economies may not have. And the military junta isn't likely to have the best economic minds available. So Niger needs to think carefully. Is it worth risking a complete collapse just to vent against its former colonizer? And France needs to do better as well. Whatever outreach Macron has undertaken through the years has clearly failed to sway Niger. France needs to acknowledge its failures in West Africa and it needs to become an equal partner to its former colonies. We just told you about the Indian economy. The Russian economy is booming too. In fact, contrary to expectations, the war has failed to dent growth. New numbers are out. In the month of June, Russia grew at 5.3%. This is on a year-on-year -year basis. Clearly, Western sanctions have not had the kind of impact they expected. The hope was that sanctions would put pressure on Russia and force Vladimir Putin to end the war. They've achieved, achieved the very opposite. Putin is doubling down. Russian forces are hiring more soldiers. Not just at home, they're scouting for talent in Kazakhstan too. That is their new recruitment ground. Moscow has released an online ad. In fact, multiple ads. They feature Russian and Kazakh flags. And a slogan which says, shoulder to shoulder. The ad makes an attractive offer to Kazakh citizens. Sign up to fight for the Russian forces. And get a joining bonus of 495,000 rubles. How much money is that? Some 5,200 US dollars. That's the joining bonus they're offering. And what is the salary? At least 190,000 rubles or some 2,000 US dollars, plus some perks, which they've not spelled out. Next question. Where will these new recruits go? The ad does not mention Ukraine. It says the potential recruits will join the Russian army in the Far East, specifically the Sakhalin region. Why is Russia recruiting from Kazakhstan, though? because they're running out of recruits at home. So they're casting a wider net. And Kazakhstan, on paper at least, seems like a good fit. The country is a former Soviet republic. It is home to about 3.5 million ethnic Russians. Plus, Russia and Kazakhstan are allies. So there's a lot going for this. But there's a problem too. The Kazakh government does not support the war in Ukraine. Also, their law bans citizens from fighting abroad. But that's not stopping Moscow from trying. They're pulling out all stops now. Even coming up with a TV show, a daily show, one hour long, featuring the wives and mothers of Russian military recruits, they'll narrate their stories and tales of heroism. The idea is to encourage more people to sign up. 
There are recruitment billboards all over Russia. The target audience of these ads are taxi drivers, fitness instructors, and security guards. This ad encourages them to give up their jobs and, quote unquote, become a warrior instead. That's what they're asking people to do. There's a slogan too. You're a man, so be one. That's what it says. And there are Hollywood style recruitment videos. Take a look at this one. So ads like these have been doing the rounds. What have they achieved so far? By the month of June, 117,000 new recruits had signed up. This is after Putin mobilized 300,000 reservists, which happened last fall. It led to a mass exodus from Russia. Several thousand eligible recruits left the country, although it does not seem to have hit Russia's war plans. Their forces are still fighting. They're fighting with the same level of intensity. And now they're looking for more recruits. What does this tell you? that Russia plans to continue the fighting. Same is the case with Ukraine. Their forces are also recruiting in large numbers. But Zelensky is unhappy, not because he can't get the soldiers he wants to get. Zelensky is unhappy with the recruitment centers. They conducted an audit into these centers, and they found rampant corruption. The full report is not out yet, but some stories have emerged. There was one case from Odessa. The head of the recruitment center is in detention now. He's accused of corruption and embezzlement. A trial is believed to be underway. Apparently, this official took a lot of money. How much? A little over $5 million. This was government money, but the official used it to enrich himself. Reports say he got a house in Spain and a Mercedes-Benz car, all in the name of his mother, apparently. And this is just one case. It's not clear how deep the rot is. Like I said, the full report is still awaited. President Zelensky has pledged to fix these recruitment centers now. He said that there are, quote unquote, numerous abuses, which he finds, and I'm quoting again, he finds them revolting, he says. But this is not the first time he's making these promises or such comments. Corruption has been a perennial problem in Ukraine. Zelensky has fired dozens of officials during the course of this war. Some were even part of his inner circle. He fired them. But this has failed to fix the problem. So this is what we have, a conflict that is stretching far longer than expected. And both Russia and Ukraine grappling with their limitations. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. We have more from China, where a car drives off a collapsed bridge on a highway and falls into a crater. No casualties were reported, thankfully. A red statue of Vladimir Putin pops up in a Roman playground. The effigy shows Putin sitting on top of a miniature war tank. Selfies claim yet another casualty. German tourists destroy a historic statue in Italy while posing for a photo. And finally, what makes August 4th significant? Let's go back to the year 1956, when Apsara became operational. Apsara is India's oldest nuclear research reactor and Asia's first. We're leaving you with these images. Thank you for watching. We'll see you tomorrow.